Hello, um, my name is uh, Christoph, Pastor Christoph Akagla. I'm Associate Pastor to Pastor Dan at the Riverside Assembly of God. Uh, today is uh, really kind of uh, a special day to us. Um, we are celebrating a cross-culture uh, uh, ministry. Uh, this is a reminder us um, a, a wonderful way uh, to know that uh, when we talk about church, is really uh, people coming together from every tongue, nation, and uh, gather together because the name of Jesus and worship Him together. Um, I love this ministry. Uh, I remember back when I was in, at uh, uh, at college, and uh, my uh, pastor, uh, Lafferty, Dr. Lafferty, we talk about this ministry, and uh, when we started, it just like uh, having um, uh, a small group of African people to do this ministry, and uh, and when I start uh, leading that group, I I just see the vision, uh, like uh, these things could be, a, 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 you know, could be uh, something we can extend to. Uh, have a big picture of what God truly wants us to do. That's why the cross-culture uh, celebration come about. And uh, we are doing this since, uh, I would say, 2008. Uh, actually, 2009 was the, the time we started inviting other churches to come along and to celebrate this with us. And uh, it was so successful. We have so many people coming. We have so many churches uh, doing, uh, you know, sketch and, and just uh, be part of what we are doing and uh, it was a, a true a blessing uh, we just pray God to use us uh, I know it's uh, so many things we we want to do and so many things need to be done for the glory of God uh, uh, that our desire is that we can reach out to the people so many people um, they may not look like us they may not be part of a congregation, great congregation or bigger congregation, but when we do this, we set apart all this, um, uh, you know, the problem people may have in the, in the perception, thinking that, uh, you know what, we don't look like those people, therefore we cannot worship with them. So we are breaking those things to try to reach out to people who just come into this country um, every single day, who need the Lord, who need to be encouraged, who need to be embraced. So we are extending our, this ministry to do exactly the same things and to encourage all churches to do the same thing, to start thinking about people around them, people in their neighborhood, and the people in the workplace and, and, and the places they know that uh, uh, they are just uh, people who need God. So. Um, Today is one of, one of the wonderful days we have just to remind ourselves to worship together. Uh, it's just like the picture for how we will be one day at heaven and uh, to worship the Lord. So uh, I know that was just exact, just that's all I have to say. And uh, we are so glad that um, everybody is part of it. And we look forward again uh, to do the same things in the next uh, October. We do that in October and May twice in a year. So, praise the Lord. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to Riverside Assembly of God. It's a great opportunity and honor for us to be able to host everybody in kind of gathering across cultures. Uh, it's already been said that uh, if you look around, this is what heaven is going to be like. It's already been said, if you listen, this is what the praise of heaven is going to be like. Hallelujah. And let me tell you this, after this service is over, we're going to eat some food that's going to taste what like heaven is going to be like. Yeah. I've been watching my time and I understand that people are getting a little anxious to taste some heaven after service, so I'm not going to keep you very long. But I just want to share some of the few things with you that God has put upon my heart. 
But I believe it's important, not just for Riverside Assembly of God, not just for the Assemblies of God, not just for the Spanish Assemblies of God, not just for, for uh, every different church that's here today, but for the church of Jesus Christ, here's some words that I think that we need to hear. Amen. You know, something that's very important is last words. You know, sometimes, you know, very rarely do we actually get to plan what our last words are going to be. Uh, most times when we hear, you know, your last words, it's, uh, you know, it's, ah! Uh, our last words are, you know, something like, uh, hey, you know, buckle your seatbelt. I think I can try something. Sometimes our last words are profound. Sometimes our last words are silly. Sometimes our last words tell us what kind of people we are. P.T. Barnum, who uh, became famous with, uh, with the circus, it's reported that his last words right before he died was, what was the box office today at Madison Square Garden? He wanted to know how much money he made that day. It's reported that uh, uh, that Queen Elizabeth I, when she died, the thing that she said, she said, all my kingdom for a minute more. All my kingdom for a minute more. She wanted more of life. Sometimes those last words can be, last words can be very important. One of the last words that I want us to take a look at today is the last words that Jesus gave to his disciples before he left his ministry on the earth. And here they are. Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20, it says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All right, let's stop there. If someone starts their sentence saying, I have all authority in heaven and earth, you should probably listen to him, right? Amen. If somebody starts their sentence saying, all authority in the universe has been given to me, then I better listen to what he's about to say. And this is what he says. He says, therefore, in other words, because all authority has been given to me, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always. This was the last thing that Jesus was going to say to his disciples while on earth. If he, that was the last thing he was going to say, it's probably something we should pay some extra special attention to. And it looks to me like Jesus is saying, make disciples is the one thing Jesus is telling his disciples to do. All the other things, the going, the teaching, the baptizing, all those things are the how-to. This is how you make disciples. But the one thing Jesus told us to do is make disciples. So if that is the last instruction of Jesus, and that is so important, and it's so plain, why do we stink at it so much? Amen. Why are we so lousy at making disciples? Amen. Millions of people every year get saved in evangelical churches. And we keep about 6 or 7% of those people who get saved. Let me say that again. Millions of people are saved every year. And do you know how many we keep in our churches from those millions that are saved? Five, six, maybe seven percent of them. Where are the rest of them? We didn't make them into disciples. And it's the one thing Jesus told us to do. He didn't say go and make new converts. He said make disciples. Disciples, somebody who's growing in him. Somebody who is in love with him. Now, Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. But it's very hard to be a disciple of Jesus Christ if I'm not part of a local church. It's almost impossible for me to be growing in Jesus the way I'm supposed to be if I'm not part of that local church. And according to George Barno, who's a, a person who, who does studies and polls and asks questions and calls and, and, and does these great studies about what the church is like, he says the behaviors, the attitudes, and the beliefs of people who call themselves Christians isn't that much different from the beliefs, the attitudes, and the behaviors of people who don't call themselves Christians. 
We are great at getting people to an altar. We're pretty, we're great at worship. We're awesome at worship. We're great and pretty good at keeping them in a the pews. But we stink at making disciples. Life changing, not just life changing in me, life changing out there, disciples. Disciples are going to impact our world. Disciples are going to win the world for Christ. Disciples are going to impact our culture. You know, we look and we complain, and Christians complain all the time. That's, that's their number one thing that they like to do. Just read Facebook for a while. Christians love to complain about how bad it is in the world. Well, if it's bad in the world, it's our fault. Because right. we haven't made an impact on our culture. We haven't been the kind of disciples that we're supposed to be. Well, how do we get this way? Just a few ideas of how we became this lousy at making disciples. First of all, I think we have been focusing on the wrong things. Now, we've been focusing on some good things. We've focused on things like evangelism. We've focused on missions and preaching and revival. And these are all good things. But they should be the result of discipleship. Amen. Those things, you know, if, if we are really making disciples, you know what? We don't have to worry about evangelism. Because right. when I make a real disciple, he's going to want to tell people about Jesus. If, if I'm really making disciples in my church, I don't have to worry about missions because people are excited about telling the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world. Amen. If I'm really making disciples, I don't have to worry about godly worship because you know what? I can have great worship and lousy disciples. Let me say that again. I can have fantastic worship and lousy disciples. There's a story in the Bible in the Old Testament where the people of Israel were ready to go and, 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 and go into battle. And they run into battle and they get defeated. Like 10,000 Israelites die in the battle. And so they all come up and they're, they're all beaten up. And oh goodness, what was wrong? What was wrong? And then the ark comes into the camp. And people start praising God. And they're thanking God. And they're dancing and they're singing. And it's like, yes, the ark is here. And the Philistines hear the hubbub and the uproar from the camp in Israel. And they say, oh my goodness, God is in their camp. We've got, we better fight like we've never fought before. And the Israelites say, yeah, yeah, God is on our side. And they rush out, and 30,000 Israelites get killed this time. Do you know why? Because they were having a great worship service, but their hearts were full of sin. They weren't following God. They weren't in the place where God wanted them to be. Because I can be a lousy disciple and have a blast in worship. Okay? I can be a lousy disciple and give a lot in the offering. I can be a lousy disciple and be praying for revival. Folks, we've got our focus on the wrong thing. Our focus needs to be on making disciples. Our focus needs to be on people growing in the Lord. Our focus needs to be on building relationships with people that will encourage them to be better and closer to Christ. If we do that, the one thing Jesus told us to do, everything else is going to take care of itself. Evangelism is going to take care of itself. Missions is going to take care of itself. If I've got a church full of disciples, let me tell you something, the Thuin hasn't seen nothing yet. If I've got a church full of disciples, the Merrimack Valley hasn't seen nothing yet. That is the thing that I want to do more than anything else is build a church full of disciples. And not just our church, but every church across New England, across the Northeast, across our country, across the world, needs to get back to the focus that Jesus called us to do, and that is to go and make disciples of all nations. Not just converts, disciples. That's what we've been called to do. So, here's another thing that I think has gotten us to this point is that we have treated church like a, no a knowledge dump. My, my, uh, my boss came up with, my, my old boss came up with that term. And what he said was this. We, we bring kids into Sunday school, we bring kids into children's church, we bring adults, we bring teens into class, and all we do is we back up a dump truck of knowledge and Bible facts, and we go beep, 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 and then we just dump it along and say, okay, here, you're a disciple now. Discipleship isn't just about memorizing scripture. Discipleship isn't just about knowing the doctrines of the church. Discipleship isn't 
isn't just about knowing the stories of the Bible. Discipleship is about changing me. Discipleship is about being more like Jesus. That's what being a disciple is. It's, we've got to focus not on just knowledge, but on transformation. The church and discipleship ministry should be about transformation, not just information. And here's another thing we do wrong. I've got us to this point is that we've left it to the pros. In other words, we say, oh, the pastor will take care of that. The pastor will take Disciples, if that's the pastor's job. Jesus told that to the disciples. You know, the, the clergy, the, 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 the pastors and the assistant pastors. That's their job. You know what? That's not what the scripture says. Look what it says in Ephesians 4, uh, chapter, verse, beginning of verse 11. It says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers, and this is what I gave them for, to equip people for works of service. Amen. Not to equip the people for everything, to equip the people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. In other words, the job of me, the job of your pastor, the job of every assistant pastor, the job of the clergy is to do the equipping of you so that you can make disciples. Your job as a Christian, your job as a brother in Christ, as my sister in Christ, your job as a follower of Jesus Christ is to make disciples. You know, you can be a great woodworker and make a... Look at this, look at this pulpit. See this pulpit? This pulpit was made 71 years ago by the founding pastor of our church. He came through and started a, a storefront church in Lawrence, and he didn't have a platform, he didn't have a pulpit, so he built it himself. And he made this beautiful job of one of the people in our church refurbishing recently, and it's, it's good looking, right? It's nice. Handcrafted, really nice, strong, woodworking skills. But you know what? As much work as you can put into a, making a pulpit, this pulpit can't make another pulpit. All right? If I make a disciple, here's the thing. If I make a disciple, that disciple can go and make another disciple. That's the kind of craftsmanship, that's the kind of work that, that works much more powerfully than just waiting for the pastor to do it all. <coughs> another reason we fail with discipleship if we, is we've treated the generations differently. Here's, and, and if you work with children's ministries, and I, I don't mean to stop uh, to stomp on anybody's toes here, but here's something we've chosen to do in our churches: is we don't want to bore our children, so we've decided to entertain our children. Okay? Which I look, I love a good entertainment as well. But you know, if we entertain kids throughout their children's ministry, and all we do is entertain. Then we bring them to their youth group, and they're like, oh, this is what, oh, well, we've got to entertain them in their youth, too. We've got to entertain them in their youth group, so we entertain them in the youth group. And then they graduate youth group, and they come to the service. And that is the most boring thing in the world, because it's not as entertaining as the youth group was. Here's the problem. We have been focused on entertaining children and teens instead of discipling children and teens. Let me tell you something, folks. Kids can be discipled. Kids can have a heart for God. Kids can be used in the gifts of the Spirit. Kids can be used in service. And we have got to focus as a church, as all of us, to say, how can I make disciples of kids? How can I make disciples of teens? You know what? What happens to our teens as soon as they leave youth group? They're gone, aren't they? Right. Where, where do they go? Oh, well, you know, we lose so many of our kids, and it's because they come to church and, boy, this isn't like your group. But if I make them into disciples, into servants of the Lord, they're going to say, what can I do to serve God here? Right. What can I do to, to lift up my church, to lift up my brothers and sisters in Christ? That's the kind of discipleship that if we start as their kids, moving them into their teens and into adulthood, we're going to have a stronger church for Jesus Christ. We can't treat the generations that differently. So what do we do? We are in a crisis of discipleship. We are losing our influence in the world because we're creating churchgoers instead of creating disciples. And making disciples is the one thing 
Jesus told to do. So we know about the crisis. What are we going to do? I think there's a few suggestions, and I'm trying, I'm still working on this, to shape my ministry around that. The first is to focus on discipleship. We've talked about it. It's not about the size of our churches. It's not about how many programs we have. It's not how big our offerings are. It's not even about the miracles that we see. It's not even about getting people to an altar. It's about making disciples. And that's it. One of the things I told the church for when I came is, look, we're going to look at the ministries of our church. If they're making disciples, they stay. If they're not making disciples, we either change them or into the dumpster. Because that's the one thing Jesus told us to do. We've got to focus on discipleship. We get people, <coughs> we want to make people who are moving to the next relationship, the next level of the relationship to the Lord. We want to make people who are dedicated to worshiping God, who are growing in their knowledge of God's Word. We want to make people who are connecting to each other, going out to evangelize, people serving the church and the community for Christ. If our churches were filled with that kind of disciple, we would make an impact for the kingdom throughout the Merrimack Valley and beyond. So focus on discipleship. Second thing we should do is to present the gospel to people. The first step in true discipleship is accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. It's only the first step, but it is an important step. The, the saying, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. If we're going to cure this culture of discipleship, we need to be dedicated to getting people to an altar. We need to be dedicated to getting people to understand what a relationship with Jesus Christ is about. We call that evangelism. We should share the truth and how Jesus died on the cross to remove our sins. How His forgiveness is now offered to all who will repent. But evangelism is more than that. Evangelism is how we treat others. Evangelism is what we say in the presence of unbelievers. Evangelism is how we show our love to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Evangelism is how we show our love to the person who just cut us off in traffic. Evangelism is how we show our love to the waitress that got our order wrong. Evangelism is also humbly apologizing when we mess up. Folks, the world is watching us. So let's show them Jesus. Another thing we need to do in our churches in order to cure this crisis of discipleship is to care for new Christians. If we create converts and then don't help them on a discipleship journey, that is a recipe for disaster. Like we said, that almost 95% of people who get saved in our churches and they don't stay in church is because we haven't done our job in helping them become true believers and disciples of Christ. A new believer who doesn't have the support of their fellow believers, it's not going to work. They're not going to become a disciple. And this is the job of pastors. This is the job of all of us in the church. Amen. We as Christians need to prepare to receive those who are both scared and excited at the same time about their new life in Christ. Anybody remember when they became a Christian? Yeah. You're excited. Anybody say, yes, I was excited. Anybody say, I was scared. Okay, there are a few of us who are scared too. And there are a lot of people who come to Christ and they're like, I don't know anything that I'm doing like that. I'm scared. I'm excited. I feel the love of Jesus. But man, I am scared to death about what this is going to do about it. They need people to come alongside them and say, you know what? This is an incredible journey. I'm going to walk with you. Come on, let's go together. Let's walk beside each other and follow each other. Follow along with Jesus on the road of discipleship to the journey and in the direction that he wants us to go. <clears throat> we can expect our pastors, uh, we can't expect our pastors all by themselves to welcome and help every new Christian be, uh, become a new disciple in the church. This is the time they are open to the possibilities of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is the time they are in the greatest need of assistance as they begin the journey. If we saw, a, saw parents that had a baby and then they just left it on their own, we would say that is neglect and they should be arrested. But we in the church do that all the time. We bring people to Christ. We bring them to the altar and say, here's a book. Enjoy your life in Christ. Here's our number if you have any at all. We need as brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, we see people coming to that altar, come up to that person and say, hey man, that's all you just made a decision with Jesus. My name is Dan. Just, uh, can I, you, you want to meet for coffee on Tuesday? 
And it's just coming. You know, I, I just we have a great Sunday school class. I'm sitting in that Sunday school class. Come and sit next to me. And if you had a person, for every person that got saved, man, you would keep so many people that came to that altar. And they would get so excited about Jesus. And you would have a partner to grow together with. We aren't meant to grow by ourselves. Amen. We aren't meant to grow closer to Jesus all by ourselves. He gave us the body of Christ. One of the greatest gifts he's ever given to us is us. We grow together in Christ. But we don't grow at all. All right, I'm, I'm going. Another thing that we need if we're going to focus on making disciples is the study and application of the Bible. The Bible holds the key for true discipleship. To try and be a disciple without studying the Bible is like trying to build an engine without having any knowledge of mechanics whatsoever. If we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to know what Jesus is like, right? Yeah. <coughs> I told a story in my church once. When I was a little kid, I, I used to, anybody remember, there was a comedian, an American comedian named Rich Little, who used to do uh, impersonations of people. And it was a long time ago, so he would do, you know, impersonations of John Wayne and, and uh, President Nixon. So this is, I'm very, very old. <laughs> but I used to love to watch his TV show. And, you know, here I am, like eight years old. And I'm watching Rich Little do an impersonation of Johnny Carson, who used to host The Tonight Show back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. But uh, he's doing an uh, impersonation. And so I decide, at eight years old, that you know, next morning I'm going to come into my mom, make her laugh, I'm going to do my Johnny Carson impersonation. And I start doing this, and my mother's like, what in the world are you doing? I'm like, I'm doing Johnny Carson, it's Johnny Carson. Remember, I'm eight years old. Tonight's show comes on at like 11.30 at night. I've never seen Johnny Carson in my life. And so I'm trying to copy someone that I don't know that much about. All I'm doing, all the best that I can do is try to copy somebody else who's trying to copy. That's what we're doing in discipleship, folks. That's what we're doing in our church. People don't know about Jesus and we're expecting them to act like Jesus. Because they haven't studied the word of truth. And folks, let me tell you something. There's something that I tell my church, and your pastor might not dis might disagree with me. You listen to your pastor. But this is what I tell my church. If you only have one hour to get to Jesus every week, don't come to Sunday morning service. Go to Sunday school. Go to Bible study. Go, go to a home group. Find something with a small group of people that you're going to be able to hear God's word and learn together. Hey, this, this is what I'm Good friend Frank, thank you, sir. Yeah, that's a servant, folks. He's a disciple of Jesus Christ. <laughs> but, but it's true, folks. I love Sunday morning service. It's full of unity and joy and worship. And we can encourage people. I can encourage people. But as far as really making strong disciples and, and relating it to every personal life, I can't do that in Sunday morning service. I got a couple hundred people there. I can't. You know, focus on every single person's problem. But if I'm sitting in a group of 12 people, if I'm sitting in a group of six people around a table, if I'm sitting one on one, you know, and if we're opening the word together and say, how can you, how would you apply this to your life? Man, disciples are being made when we do things like that. So I encourage you, if we're going to make true disciples in the church, we've got to focus on getting people to understand the word of truth and applying the word of truth to their lives. We're going to progress on this journey. We need to apply the word, understand it. Application is necessary for life transformation. One last thing we need to do if we're going to build strong disciples, if we're going to really focus on discipleship, is to build strong discipleship relationships. The strongest discipleship comes through relationships. People, the people who truly built into your life, are, weren't just the ones who preached a sermon to you. Weren't just the ones who taught a lecture to you. They were the people who sat with you. They were the people who listened to you. They were the people that prayed with you. Those are the people that made a difference in your life, aren't they? Our relationships have a tremendous impact on who we are and what we become. Brothers and sisters, the biggest impact Jesus made wasn't preaching to 5,000 people. The biggest impact Jesus made 
was hanging out with 12 guys. Because those 12 guys turned the world upside down. All right? Jesus preached to thousands of people on the hillside. After Jesus rose again, and Jesus was telling him, go and make disciples, where were those thousands of people? They weren't around, but the disciples were there. The ones he had built relationships with. Folks, churches should be places where disciple-building relationships are formed and nurtured. We need opportunities to pray together. We need opportunities to laugh together. We need opportunities to study together and encourage each other. If we're going to cure the crisis of discipleship, we must be dedicated, each of us, to building relationships with people that we can encourage them to become stronger Christians. That means believers to minister to each other rather than expecting your pastors to do all the work. Let me conclude by saying this. One of these days, I'm going to die. It's true. Uh, they're going to, some, a couple, some students from North Point Bible College are going to come into my office. They're going to take my books and put them in boxes and bring them to the library up in North Point. There's going to be a nice funeral. Then eventually, Riverside Assembly God will pick a new pastor. And aside from my family and a few close friends, you know, they're not going to remember me all that much. But that's okay. That happens to just about everybody. The purpose of my life is not to have people remember me. The purpose of my life is not to have a wave of the church named after me. My job, while I'm here, is to cause damage to the devil's plans. And not just, look, not just little damage that he can shave off and start all over again. I want to cause permanent damage to the devil's plans. And this is how I do it. It's not by crazy. It's not by, it, it, it's, it's not even by just praying. The way I cause great damage to the plans of the devil is I make disciples. Yes. That after I am dead and gone, those disciples are still disciples and they're going to make disciples of other people. Yes. That's damage. That's damage that's going to make an impact on, on the devil's plans and he's going to say, man, I hated that damn family God. I'm still dealing with the stuff that he did. That's the kind of damage I want. That's how we bring about revival. That's true revival. That's how we win this world for Christ. But we can't do it without relying on the power of Jesus to encourage, direct, and enable us to do His will. So when we do fly from this world into His arms, He's going to say, Dan, good job. Come on, man. That was awesome. That was awesome. You messed up a lot. But I forgive you for that. But you made some disciples. Yes. Come on in. We're going to have a party. And I want all of us to have that same greeting where Jesus Amen. says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You did the one thing I asked everybody to do. You made disciples. If our focus isn't on discipleship, change your focus. And do some permanent damage. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you've called us to do. We rely on the power of your spirit because by doing it, trying to do it on our own, we're going to fail. So God, give us the strength to do what you have called us to do. You never call us to do something that you don't strengthen us and equip us to do. So God, I ask that you be with every pastor that is here, every clergy person, everybody that's a leader in the church, that you would help them to truly focus, help me to truly focus on what you called us to do. And for every person that studies under a pastor, under a leader, God, help them to see that discipleship for themselves only works when we grow together. Help them to see the job of making disciples is not their pastors, it's theirs. Give us the power to do it. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, I want to invite everybody to the fellowship that we're going to have afterwards. Let's encourage each other and love on each other and enjoy some good food and compliment the good chef. I'm here at Cross 
cultural meal myself. I'm in a Puerto Rican condition as Italian pasta. So who knows what kind of thing that that's going to but, but may God richly bless you. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to ask Chris Bob to come to uh, dismiss us. But may God richly bless you. What do you think? Amen. 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 What the pastor then just said about disciple. Discipleship is the key. Like he told us, that's the last word that Jesus left for us. And we have to follow his direction. But before you become a disciple, the first thing that you have to do is to give your life to Christ. If you are in this room and you have not received Jesus Christ, you don't want to discipline this place. This needs all of you and now give you opportunity to give your life to Christ. So we are going to be here. Uh, my brother Ernie, please could you stand up? One of the leaders, Super Gender Sunday School. He's going to be here also in the front. Uh, and Pastor Shen is going to be here too. So if you don't, uh, or the pastor, you know, I know he likes to leave me alone, but I don't want to touch you today. <laughs> And uh, any, anyone who have not, or if you need prayer, we have uh, people here, the leaders here, who are going to pray for you. I know we're going to have time to fellowship, we're going to have time to share the food. But you know what? We don't want to just, because food, and walk away and just rush. We want you, if there's something bothering you right now, and you need that touch, or you need prayer for one of us, please come to this altar. We would like to pray for you. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray to dismiss it, but we're going to be here waiting for you. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord Jesus, for using Pastor Dan to open our hearts. God, to give us again, to remind us the main job, the main purpose of who we are is to follow the direction of Jesus Christ, to go and to make disciples. Heavenly Father, I pray for each person represented in, from this church here. Those who really who don't know what to do, Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, that this word that we preach won't be vain in war, but the word that we stay with us. When we go back to our church, that we start meditating in it. Holy Spirit uses to direct our step when we go back. Use us, Heavenly Father, and it happens exactly to follow what you want us to do. Now we just thank you. We ask you to bless us and also to bless the food we are about to receive and a great fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So you are this week. God bless you. And also this altar is open. If you guys want to do a little bit of music, slow music, that would be wonderful also. So, praise the Lord.